Hello, everyone. My name is Helene B. Lillør, and I am the Chief of Interventions here at the Rockwood Foundation. We're situated in Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark, and it is a great pleasure to be able to welcome you all this week uh, on system innovation. The interest in this conference has been overwhelming. Uh, almost all of you are right now sitting alone behind the screen like me, uh, but together we're actually more than 1500 people from all over the world who have signed up. I am very humbled by this huge interest and so is the entire team behind the System Innovation Initiative. At the Rockwell Foundation, we strive to generate knowledge about complex social change and challenge. And we do this to improve the basis for decision making and hopefully create more sustainable societies. And at the heart of this comes systems innovation. But a question we've been struggling with is, how do you actually do it? How do you deliberately innovate a system in need of change? And we have by no means found all the answers, but as you will see in a little bit, Charlie Ledbeater and Jenny Winhold have created a framework that can help guide us. And not least, they have found an amazing group of speakers who will be providing us with very inspiring real life examples of how they are innovating the systems that they work with in practice. I hope you'll enjoy all the speakers and the week in front of you, and that you feel that by the end of the week, your basis for decision making has improved and that you'll feel inspired and uplifted. So before handing over to Charlie, who will function as our moderator for the week, thank you all again for joining. And thank you for sharing the invite to the conference, which many of you must have done uh, for us to reach these numbers. On behalf of the entire team, again, a warm welcome to you all. And Charlie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Helena. And uh, thank you very much indeed to the Rockwell Foundation for providing such a, a great home for this initiative. Uh, and as Helena said, we're in Copenhagen. So we would love for all of you to be able to be in Copenhagen with us, but just to give you a little bit of Danish uh, hygge, um, I'm just going to light my candle here um, so you can see it and I'll put it behind me. Um, and obviously at the end, we have lots of cans of Carlsberg all lined up as well. Um, so why are we here this week? Well, um, the first is that I think a lot of people around the world think that there are big systemic challenges, whether those are to do with inequality in work or aging or mental health. I think we're gathered because we are, as Helena said, interested in how you bring about deliberate change, how you choose to, who chooses to try and act on systems and innovate. Because of that, we here at Rockwell are very interested in practical knowledge. So how do you do this? How do you go from theory or thinking or mapping into actual practice and achieving change? And so that's why this week we've assembled so many people who um, embody both theory and practice and uh, move between them. And finally, we're not just interested in how you fix existing systems, though that is a big challenge in many places, we're also interested in opportunity. We're interested in how you can see new systems or new solutions that you might want to bring about. And those topics are at the heart of our green paper. Uh, we'll share with you in the chat the link to that green paper. And I'll now ask my great colleague, Jenny Winhall, who's Director of Social Innovation at Rockwell to say a little bit about what we're going to do today. Thank you, Charlie. So today's session is all about why system innovation now 
and in particular why you. So what we want to do in today's session is to paint a broad picture of what we know about how systems change and form over time, the ingredients that go into that, and what kinds of roles are played by people um, along the way. So we hope what that will do is to give you a feeling of opportunity and possibility to tackle the challenges that you're interested in. Um, we know that for many of you, you'll be working um, uh, to uh, tackle big social challenges and feeling that you come up against lots of barriers, system barriers in that work. So it's important to remember that we made systems, it was people that made systems and we can change them. And so we're going to, uh, Charlie and I are going to share the story of system change in three acts, the past, the present and the future. We've got some very good 1970s style um, animations to help tell the story. And in each of those acts, we will walk you through um, a framework to help you position yourself in that story and the kind of role you might be able to play. So if you would like to go into um, these frameworks in more depth um, after the session, we've put together a paper um, which we'll post the link to in the chat uh, for you. You can download that. It's, it, we've called it a green paper because what we're very interested in is having some feedback um, from you about how it resonates with you and your work um, before we publish the, the next set of papers. Um, so do do that. And um, in the meantime, I hope that these frameworks are valuable to you. And back to Charlie to start us off. So just to get us started, we're going to, in the course of today, do a few polls um, just to help the conversation along. And uh, I think we're going to put up our first poll now because we're keen to find out who's in the room, where you come from, what you're interested in. So here's our first poll, which is just to ask you where you're from. And if we haven't somehow managed to cover where you're from, please uh, accept our apologies. And you simply click on the box which best describes where you're from. So we'll give you sort of 30 seconds to do that. It's not a, not a complicated question, I guess. We've had sign-ups from 71 countries uh, from all over the world, from Iran, Iraq, from Canada, North America, East Timor, Australia, Singapore, so let's see what kind of picture is revealed. And Anton, who's running this poll for us behind the scenes, I'm just going to rely on you, Anton, to bring up the answer when you're ready. So there we, there we have it. 36% um, from Denmark, a further 44% from Europe, we've got um, some from Sub-Saharan Africa, from South America, even given the time difference, and some from Asia. Let's close that poll and let's take the second poll, uh, which is what your, if we bring that up, Anton. So they already uh, answered that in the same poll, so we can already yeah. see the results of question two. Oh, so they've well. already seen, so I, ca I can't see that. And everyone can just scroll on the screen. To ah, right. Also so YouTube. it's it's down here below. Sorry, that's my own incompetence there. So mainly, I'm interested in improving a current system, 78%, and 56% creating a new system. And there's a pretty even split, sort of um, almost Donald Trump versus Joe Biden split of inside the system or outside the system. So there are quite a few outsiders so that must mean there are some outsiders who are trying to change a current system so there we go okay so that orientates us a bit and i just want to quickly introduce you to some of the other things that we've got going so unlike uh, a normal zoom call the way to interact in this call is not through the chat but through the question and answer function down here and one of the big questions we're interested in um hearing your answer to is what kind of challenge you're interested in innovating around what kind of things most interest you so please do go to that and running that uh, who can give us a brief explanation of how it works is our colleague Johannes 
Johannes. Hi, everyone. So the chat would get overwhelming with this amount of people on. So in the chat that we would usually use in a meeting, um, we can write to you, but you can't interact in there. What we will use instead is the Q&A button that you also find in the bottom of your screen. Um, if you'd open that, you can see, um, uh, you can post questions. I will uh, interact and we can, we can uh, let's have questions going along as we, uh, um, as we go along this meeting. Everyone can answer questions, everyone can upvote. You know, let's have a little interaction going on in there. I'll make sure to, to, to type along and, uh, and comment on, on any questions. I'd love for you to hear actually, if we start out with the first question, like what, uh, challenges, what challenges are actually interested in tackling? Like we might get going on that question first. Great. So let's keep that alive. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, and also going on, we have in Mexico City an amazing graphic recorder called Riley. We're not going to show you Riley, but we are in the course of the discussion going to show you her work as she tries to sum it up. And you'll get a digital copy of her um, graphic synthesis of, of the discussion. And of course, we have social media. We'll share the social media tags, um, uh, the hashtags for you to use. And we will be recording this session so that you can listen back to it afterwards. So that's all the setup. Without further ado, um, shall we move on to Act One, Jenny? Yes, thank you, Charlie. So Act One, um, Act One is history. So we are interested in um, starting with a bit of history so that we can try and understand how systems have changed over time uh, to help us work out what it is that we might need to do to help them to change deliberately. So one way to do that is to look at some of the, the, the big transitions that we've gone through um, in the past and to see what kinds of lessons we can draw out of that. So Charlie, if you will, could you start us off with um, a story of how a new system um, formed? Yeah, so I'm actually now going to do this um, late 1980s children's television animation bit by telling you the story of containerization. Um, I don't, can you see this now? There we go. So the story starts with this guy, Malcolm McLean, who's a trucker and he's got a problem and he can't get his trucks up and down the east, eastern seaboard um, very easily, they're congested. And so he tries to think of a solution. And the solution he comes up with is borrowed from some things he's heard about going on in Alaska, and it's the container. And so McLean decides to build some containers, put his goods in them and sail them up the Eastern seaboard on a converted freighter called the Ideal X. And even on that first voyage, it's evident that containerization could be massively more efficient than the dominant uh, system. And then broadly speaking, what happens is absolutely nothing, um, as often is the case with radical innovations. And so McLean takes his idea, the container and the ship, and really for the first, I don't know, 10 years or so, Nothing much seems to happen, except going on in the background, there is stuff happening. And there are some people we call systematizers who take his original uh, innovation and they make it more systematic. They standardize it. They create protocols for how containers should be handled and designed and clipped together and so on and so forth. And this is a company mainly called Matson in Hawaii. So then the next stage of the process is that there are a couple of really big changes go on. The first is that many more manufacturers of products come into the scene with globalization, particularly in uh, Asia, and new supply chains get opened up and new systems of production get made, and they need people to carry their goods. And then people start investing in creating new systems. And so 
what you then get is the creation of entirely new ports with cranes and uh, vast acreages capable of handling thousands of containers. And of course, you get the emergence of new container ships, massive ships carrying uh, containers all around the world. And all of this is united by a system of information, of logistics, of insurance, of finance, of trade. And you go from an original idea here, McLean, and his scratchy little innovation where he's trying to solve a particular problem, probably 20 years later, to containerization as a system. And it's containerization which changes the world. So thank you, Charlie. That's really that's really interesting. But there are lots of things going on in this story, aren't there? Lots of different levels. Um, how would you suggest that we make sense of the different movements that are happening there? Well, so to do that, we've been very influenced by this model, our redrawing of this model from uh, a, a guy, an academic called Frank Gilles. And Frank Gilles' work will be familiar to many people. Um, He's a historian of social and technical change. And broadly speaking, Frank's model is that there's a sort of macro level changes in what he calls the landscape. There are meso level changes in what he calls the regime, the sort of engine room of the system. And there are micro level changes, which are changes in entrepreneurship or ways of life. And over time, systems can adapt and change because of change at these three levels. So often in the beginning, they are, the system is aligned. It's got a certain kind of structure. Um, and then it goes through a process of disalignment where it's destabilized. Old systems start to break up, new ones start to emerge and form, and then eventually a successor system emerges. So if you think back to um, the story of Malcolm McLean, the, the traditional freight system here had been working away you know, quite happily for a very long time, going back to sailing boats and all the rest of it. And so down here, you see Malcolm McLean. And Malcolm McLean is what we would call a system shifting venture, because inside the venture is the possibility of a new kind of system. And over time, that teams up with other kinds of innovations towards what we would call something like a minimum viable system. It's the makings of a new system. It's not a system yet, but it's got the makings. Up here in the landscape area, you have a big shift in conditions like a change in the weather, change in the climate uh, with globalization. And that shift then creates the possibility that a new system might be needed. And so then what you see here then in the middle in the regime is a contest between the old system trying to keep on and the new system trying to be born. So there's a power struggle. There's also a lot of investment. There's destruction and winding things down. There's also creation. And eventually after quite a protracted period, you get to a new realignment of the three levels. So that's our retelling of Frank Beals' story of how change comes about in systems. So Charlie, the, the story of containerization is really a story of commercial innovation, isn't it? Technological innovation, commercial innovation to open up a new market. How translatable do, do we think that framework is that you've just presented to us here to the more social kinds of systems that we're interested in? So systems for producing public goods like health and work and education. Um, can we still think of things at those three levels? Well, the people we've been working with, advising, learning from, researching, I think find this um, three levels across three phases diagram very helpful. And on Wednesday afternoon, in fact, we will be lucky enough to have a session which includes Al Etmansky, the great Canadian social entrepreneur, who's been an advocate, campaigner, innovator in the field of disability over many, many years. He'll be known to many people. And if you look at Al's work, you'll see that in some ways he's spent a long time 
trying to change what's happening at this sort of macro level, the way that disability is thought of, the kind of rights and um, dignity, I suppose, the ethical uh, position of uh, people with disability. He's spent a lot of time working in this level, both shutting down institutions um, and creating new models like a registered disability savings plan, like new models of care, so on and so forth. And he spent a lot of time working down here with people developing those alternatives, individual budgets, more relational approaches to care, so on and so forth. So certainly the story of what Al has done um, over many years to transform the way that disability is seen operates very clearly across these three levels. And it's the interaction between them that really generates system change. Mm -hmm. So for, for our participants listening, if we want to um, bring about that kind of change, we need to be thinking about those three levels and how we either work in each of them or connect them together. Um, Charlie, can you tell us what, what are some of the other lessons you think we should take away um, from this model? Well, I think one is about time. Um, and this is a point that Terry Irwin, the uh, um, the sort of expert in transition design makes as well, which is that this can be quite a protracted process. So if you're interested in changing systems and you have to do it urgently because there's an urgent need, this is too long a time. But actually there's a, another dimension to it, which is that when you get to this period, this process in the middle, then change can suddenly take off and then a system can flip. Um, and so it can go very slowly and then suddenly very quickly. It's a sort of punctuated process. And I suppose the other two kind of things to bear in mind are one that it involves often these struggles between new systems and old in the middle here. Um, and these are often struggles over power, but it's also about changing purpose. So when McLean started down here in one of these niches, McLean was not trying to create a new system. He was just trying to solve a problem. And really, the purpose of containerization only became apparent much later when the conditions have changed. And so creating new systems is, as Donella Meadows um, first told us, almost inevitably always a question of what kind of purpose you're serving and how you discover that purpose or how it comes about. Great, thank you. So let's um, let's have a look at this together with um, the people who are joining us today. So participants, as you've been listening to Charlie's story, um, we'd like to know if you've been thinking about yourself and where you are in whatever challenge it is that you're setting out to, to meet. And perhaps we could just open the next poll, Anton, to see um, where it is that you think you're operating. So do you think that you're mostly engaging with that macro level, responding to shifts in the landscape? Um, do, you, do you think you're working in the regime? Are you part of the organizations that make up that meso level um, in the regime? Or are you somebody who is uh, creating innovations in the, in the niches um, at the bottom there, like Malcolm McLean was in that? containerization story. So if we just have your thoughts on those. And then Johannes, maybe we could also put a, a question in the Q&A about where people think they're experiencing on these three levels, both the greatest opportunities and the biggest obstacles. And then Charlie, I'll hand it back to you to pick up on the answers. I'm just going to go through this poll and and here are the answers so quite a large number of people think that they're operating at the micro uh, in the in the niches where the new is being created there is a significant minority a third of people are operating within the regime but trying to change the system from within and there's sort of a fifth operating on the landscape level, trying to shift the conditions in which new systems might emerge. So, so that's, that's interesting. 
Um, we're now going to move on. Before we do, I'm just going to remind us that we do have our brilliant graphic recorder in Mexico, um, who's been working away on showing some of the things that we've been talking about and creating um, a kind of recording of them. That's her work. It will unfold as we go on and become more complex and hopefully pull it all together. Jenny, without further ado, should we move on to act two? And act two is the present. So we've touched on the past. Now let's talk about the present. Like it or not, systems are very powerful, but often very rigid. They're very stuck. They're quite difficult to budge. So what are the keys to unlocking systems? So Charlie, let's go to Glasgow only a few years ago. And here's the Glasgow uh, landscape. And brutal crimes are being committed by young men with knives and machetes in broad daylight, captured on CCTV um, as people around them do their shopping. So Glasgow has become the murder capital of Europe and Karen McCluskey has just become the chief police officer in charge. So the best she can hope for, or so everyone tells her, is a slightly better response rate. But Karen and her fellow officers have seen generation after generation of young people uh, following the same patterns of violence and abuse. It's a very deep seated challenge and she knows she has to find a different way to tackle it. So what Karen does is to start from a very different place. Instead of seeing this as a criminal justice challenge, she frames it as a public health challenge. So she realizes that violence is infectious. You can catch it, you can pass it on. That's what's happened um, with these young people. And so her new philosophy is to treat violence not as a crime to be punished, but as a disease um, with the goal of preventing that disease from spreading. And so Karen sets out to build an entirely new system that will stop this epidemic of violence. It will contain it, prevent it and eradicate it. And of course, what that allows Karen to do is to use completely different strategies to start to contain um, the spread of, of violence. So she starts working with um, surgeons in the hospitals in Glasgow who are fed up of treating young people who have had their faces cut open in what's called a Glasgow smile. And she trains up nurses to work with those young people whilst they're in the hospitals and offer them a way out of the gangs that they're part of. And she installs volunteers inside the hospitals to work with them to make sure that they've got a route out. The second thing she does is to uh, build a huge database um, tracking incidents of violence back over about 15 years. And what she's trying to do is to trace them back to the households that um, originated that, that sort of pattern of violence so she can understand or get a picture of how violence is spreading over time. She starts working with mothers in the community, uh, some of whom have watched their kids die on the streets she makes them part of the solution. She gets them to talk to groups of gang members. Uh, she works with the local schools to stop them excluding um, kids. And she sends her police officers into those schools to work with the most influential students and to train them up to be able to intervene and reduce violence if it starts to flare up. She introduces programs for child development and she's even starting a research program with the chief medical officer looking at how they can reduce cortisol um, amongst young people, which is what happens when you have a sort of fight or flight um, response, you have a high level of cortisol. So what you start to see is this whole system coming together to contain and prevent this spiral of, of violence. And it works. So cut to the present day and knife crime has dropped by 60%. Young people are moving off the streets and into work. They're doing that mostly through so, new social businesses that Karen has actually set up with her team. 
And so what Karen has done in that 10 year period is to create a completely different system and a different relationship with the community that has made Glasgow a safer place for young people to grow up in. So Jedi, thanks very much for that. And um, there's a lot going on in that story as well. How would you take Karen's story and provide some sort of structure to it so that people could work out how to uh, work on systems in a similar kind of way? What are the key ingredients that they should be working with? Sure. So we could think about um, system innovation as having um, four keys or four keys to unlock a system. First of all, there's purpose, what the system is for. There's power, who has it. There are um, resources, flows of resources, which might be money or time or people playing different roles. And of course, there are relationships. So how things are linked together to make a system work, whether that's centrally or um, distributed through, through networks of um, relationships. So what Karen did was to take on a system that was very tightly locked together. So it was, there was a fixed set of relationships in a structure that was highly optimized to use the power and the resources of the police for the purpose of catching criminals and bringing them to justice. So this is a, was a very efficient system. The police had all of the tools available to detect and respond to those violent incidents. They had state-of-the-art equipment. They knew exactly who the perpetrators of that violence were, but it was making no difference. So what Karen did was by reframing the purpose so by reframing violence as a disease, she opened up that system and set a very different purpose for it. And by putting a, a different philosophy at the heart, so a philosophy of um, treating the spread um, of violence, so drawing on lessons from epidemiology and public health, she's working with a really different logic. And that logic is, is shaping how the system um, thinks about its mission and does its mission. And of course, what happens when you change the purpose of the system, that opens up the boundaries of that system and therefore the kinds of resources that are available to it. So what you saw with Karen is that that opened up huge opportunities to engage all sorts of unusual people in the community, uh, which was everything from the fire service who she trained to go into the homes of people to fit smoke alarms and at the same time um, do a little bit of probing to see whether there was there was any violence going on in that home or whether things were all right. She also worked with private businesses so she worked with veterinary surgeons and she did that because if there's violence going on in somebody's house one of the first indications is that they they start to abuse their pets so vets often see the very first signs of that when, people, when families bring in their pets to, to be treated. So the veterinary surgeons became um, a really interesting resource in Karen's new system. And of course, in service of a new purpose, you have to search out new resources and create the new types of relationships that will unlock them. So like training vets to have different kinds of conversations with people like the nurses in the hospitals, and even setting up that new research program with the, the chief medical officer. So the system is actually made up of new people in new roles in a new relationship together. But of course, to make all of that work, you have to open up and distribute power differently. So these new relationships create a different kind of power. So the power that Karen has given to the community to the mothers, the ex-gang members, the student influences in the schools to shape their own community is an example of that. And of course, Charlie talked through in his um, examples about the, the power struggles that go on um, to define the purpose and the boundaries of the system. So Karen found herself constantly being told to get back to your job arresting people. And that's an indication that there is a sort of struggle between power and purpose going on. But these four keys allowed Karen to configure things differently. So she was able to bring them together to meet a new kind of purpose and actually to do that so that purpose was the thing that was driving power. 
So like wiring it all up differently, if you like, to light up um, a different kind of purpose. And so we think of these as the four keys to unlock system innovation, um, purpose, power, um, relationships, and flows of resources. And when a system is established, then of course they become very locked together. So we see that um, pattern uh, starting to, to, to get tighter, if you like. And often that happens in the way that it is um, power that is dictating how, uh, how purpose is understood and how resources and relationships are done to, to make that happen. So to change a system, to move from challenge to opportunity, the way these four keys interact needs to be opened up. It needs to be made more fluid, destabilized, if you like, to some extent. And of course, you can start anywhere. So Karen started with purpose, but you could also start with relationships or you could start with resources. Jenny, thanks very much indeed for that. And um, tomorrow we're going to hear from both Alex Fox and Sophie Humphreys, who've got incredible stories to tell about working within systems to try and reconfigure them using these four keys. But at this stage, let's bring in our next poll so that we can get a sense of where people see themselves in that kind of picture. So Anton, I don't know if we can bring the next poll up, the next poll question. Um, which of these four keys are most important for you to work with? Um, and remember that uh, as you're voting, Jenny pointed out that although purpose is overriding, actually you can start virtually anywhere um, as long as it gets you into the other questions. So you don't have to start by redefining purpose. Uh, you can start in other places. Let's see where people um, think are the most important of these to work with. And then after that, we're going to bring in a couple of voices of reflection and questioning from people listening online. So here we have, so that's interesting. So the, the most important thing to work with for most people is relationships, because it's presumably the relationships which allow you to get to new purpose, new power and new flows. The least important is resources. So actually, in a funny kind of way, part of Frank's story about systems change is that resources play a critical role because it's new technologies which may destabilize systems. But in the view of most of the people here, it's re reconfiguring relationships so you get a new sense of purpose and a new sense of power. So to help us along in this discussion, we're now going to be joined by two people who've come into the conversation from the outside slightly, who um, are familiar with this kind of work. And the first is Penilla Kapler, who's a strategist and consultant at Roskilde Municipality in Denmark. Very good to have you with us, Penilla. And she's joined by Cassie Robinson. And Cassie Robinson is many different things. Cassie was very influential in a lot of the early work about systems, systems thinking and systems change. She's been an entrepreneur in her own right and she's now a funder at the National Lottery, the National Lottery Community Fund in charge of UK-wide portfolio. Um, so Penelope, I'm just gonna to come to you first then to Give us one reflection and one question from what you've been hearing. How does how does this all sound in Roskilde? Does it sound abstract or does it sound relevant? It sounds relevant, and I'm just uh, keen on uh, what what of the four I should choose, because sometimes working at the mayor's office and close to the politicians, I'm in public service. I sometimes have the power or a political decision on how to change a system or how to maybe question a system inside our organization or in collaboration with others. And then other times it's really the relationships, which is the, the eye opener to the problem that we want to work with. Uh, because um, 
when we are working in a municipality, we sometimes uh, define the world with our view, with our perspective. And to change that perspective, you have to be a bit curious, but also a bit uh, brave enough to ask the citizens, how do you see this problem or this challenge? And then slowly you build relationships around the system you would like to change, and they can be the driver in the changing. So it, give, it gives good sense. So for you, actually, building new relationships is absolutely critical to building new purpose, new power, because without them, you don't get any other kind of change. And creating this more inclusive relationship with citizens is absolutely critical. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's very that's very interesting because lots of people would say, oh, you've got to start with purpose and you know, you need a new sense of purpose, but actually maybe what you need is a new sense of, of relatedness. Cassie, how does it sound to you from London? Uh, hi there. Um but it's really good to hear the work in this way and to see it as well. I love the interactive moments. Um I mean, it's interesting that um, in the poll, the lowest was resource as someone who intentionally went into work in funding, feeling like that did actually have a particularly, or not a particularly important, but one of the important roles to play in this work. Um, I suppose touching on purpose, um, you know, I feel like the purpose of many things have been shaken in this moment. Um, and so it feels like a really important time to be asking that question, you know, what is what something is for? Do we do we still know what something is for? And for funders to ask that question, um, because I don't think we ask that enough. So, I mean, Jenny already knows, but I'm I'm particularly keen on this idea of how we don't just stay in the existing system in in the uk there is a lot of talk of systems change but but i feel like it is predominantly people changing the existing system and whilst that there's nothing wrong with that um we are in a time when i think we need to make some quite big leaps and this feels like one of those moments um and i suppose the other thing i reflected on in terms of power um I feel like when we talk about power, um, I mean, there's a lot of talk about power in the funding world and rightly so, and the critique of it. Um, but I do feel like that normally tends to focus on the, on the is it the, the micro layer, the meat, I, I'm gonna get those confused. Anyway, the, the bottom layer, um, you know, that when you use the word power, even that's where we focus and we think about participatory grant making and leaders with lived experience and all these amazing things that we're doing a lot of at the fund. But I don't think we ask enough, what does it mean to bring power or think about shifting power on those other two levels? Um, so that feels like, um, yeah, that's something I'm particularly interested in exploring more as a funder. Um, and I think the question that I will leave you with, I have many, I lost, oh, I've put it out there. Um, I, I guess I'm particularly interested in this. I, I think you, you both, Charlie and Jenny, have talked about this as being, maybe it's this, this idea of the big change narrative, but those three levels, the, the, the gills work, you know, what binds them together if it's important to work? Um, with all three I think that that feels really important that that's certainly something in the work I'm doing that I, I still don't know how to do that so yeah so that's very interesting so you're interested in going from sort of fixing to creating um, and um, do you find that it's easier for people to think about fixing a current system than trying to create a, a new one, because that then does link to your point about these three levels kind of coming together, which is where does that imagination happen, that the possibility that this could all become quite different. Cassie, I'll just ask you that question, and Panira, if you've got something to say about that, that would be great, yeah. 
I do, because I find it very interesting that often we, we talk about innovation because we want to fix something, uh, change the unemployment of young people or have the elderly to stay longer in their homes or perhaps the schools to uh, attend the students in different ways and we test them. And uh, often we build system on top of each other instead of dive into the problem and sort of try to create the, the, the solution together with the people concerned. Because uh, we, we tend to have a way of fixing things uh, in, in, in achieving of certain goals that we don't always discuss. We might have a slight pur purpose, uh, build a better world, have a nice life or something, make more, more young people part of society. But if we could just uh, step a bit backwards and say, why do you, we need to create this system? Yeah. So what certainly one thing that happens, isn't it, though, is that you get sort of innovation building on innovation and it all gets sort of more and more knotted as you try and solve particular problems with particular interventions rather than stepping back and trying to say, well, is there a big new different picture? Mm -hmm. um, and certainly in Alec Mansky's work on disability, that is what he did the whole time. Cassie, what's, what's your own sense of that, of how you would knit together those three levels to create a sense of opportunity? I don't know if I have enough of a sense of it yet. I think, but I think what is interesting for me is keeping in that space of the opportunity, not uh, like and the new or the or just the different frame. Um, and I'm lucky to have Jenny on the advisory board of a new fund that we're in the very early stages of developing. But obviously, in my current role, um, you know, we we are about communities. And actually it's been quite interesting trying to translate some of the thinking and work that's gone on around systems change or systems innovation into a starting point of like, well, how do you, what does it mean to start from a community or, or multiple communities or an ecology or an ecosystem or um, an assemblage? We can give them many right. names, um, yeah. but not from, you know, children's right. service or homelessness or and right. and I I think that's yeah like that starting point feels quite different and and needs you to not fall into like well what's the existing system right it, right it, so let me just note two things about what you were saying there one is that to create new systems you need new relationships and in a way new collective identity so very much embracing that sort of relationship point but that we struggle for a language for it because the language is probably uh, bequeathed to us by the old um, system. Um, luckily, tomorrow, we have a brilliant guy, Alex Fox, the CEO of Shared Lives Plus talking to us, who has done very almost this very thing about creating a new set of relationships in a system to generate a new sense of power. Jenny, do you want to just quickly tell us what Alex has done and why it's so significant? Yes, of course. So um, perhaps we can go back to the view on the, the, the four keys. So I think um, Alex is very interesting because he's, he has actually created a different kind of model of social care for adults who need more support, um, like Haley, for example, who he talks about in his video, who has learning disabilities, called Shared Lives Plus. And it's structurally different because it touches on all four of these keys. So Alex is working alongside a system of formal social care for adults. It's very efficient, but it's often um, forced to be very transactional. And that's because the resources that are available um, to work with are what is determining the kind of relationship that's possible. So you get a system where care is rationed. You get a fixed care package with 15 minutes of um, a 15 minute visit, for example. And so Alex thought it might be possible to create a very different kind of system by starting with relationships. So he said, if we assume that people want to be part of normal family life, but need a bit more support, then what happens if we create lots of relationships out there between those adults and families in the community who might be in a position to open up their own homes and um, to take care of someone? And it turns out that 
lots of people want to do this. So about 10,000 where Alex is working. So that suddenly opens up a huge resource in the system that wasn't there before, where families get both a, a new family member and some extra income. So they become a little bit like micro providers. So money and resources is starting to flow differently. And what that does is to distribute power and agency out from the center. So it is the adults like Hayley and the families themselves who choose each other and decide for themselves what the ver their version of the good life is. So it's the relationship um, that is determining the purpose um, of what that system is doing. Because what Alex comes back to is, it, is it, that it is that quality of relationship that matters. And if you prioritize that, you can unlock all sorts of other benefits. And, and so, of course, oh, sorry, I'm just going to, because we, we need to move on to our final act, which is the future. Mm -hmm. But just to underline that, this importance of thinking about relationships as the way into thinking about power and purpose, which is revealed from the poll, but also from Penilla and, and Cassie's comments. Jenny mentioned there a video with Alex that we recorded that you can find on our platform. Um, Johannes can put a link to that in, in the chat so you can see that more extended video um, of our conversation with Alex. Jenny, should we then, move on then yes. to thinking about the future? Yes, and I think it's, I mean, I think it's also worth saying that um, what Alex is doing is a very practical, almost like a sort of stepping stone, if you like, to a new system. So you'll see um, tomorrow that the model he's created has had a kind of ripple effect on all sorts of other organizations in the location that, that he's part of. And so although he's doing something that started out quite small, it's affecting the organizations who are part of the regime who are now starting to open up and do things differently. And that's creating a wave of innovation. But Charlie, let's move on to the final act, which is about the future and how we can all change systems. And here we are, here's our super sophisticated model of systems change um, called the washing machine. Um, and called the washing machine because um, in a way we've redrawn Frank's uh, original model um, so that there are sort of two forces coming in and there are lots of forces coming out. So at the top here are, are sort of the incumbent system, which is trying to modernize, keep itself going, perhaps it's under political or resource constraints. And here are new entrants, new ideas. They might be um, entrepreneurs, they might be new ways of life, they might be people with lived experience who want to do things in new ways. And although the traditional story of innovation um, told as a story of disruptive innovation is the new displaces the old and something new comes out. What we think happens, especially in public innovation, is you get this washing machine in the middle. It's the new trying to renew itself and change and adapt, and it's the, the old trying to renew itself, and it's the new trying to find its footing that creates this kind of uh, whirring in the middle. And then out of that, on the other side, come all sorts of possibilities. So that's the basis of the washing machine model. So Charlie, can you tell us then a little bit about who's actually making that happen? So who is, who's putting the strings, well, um, if you like? We think that there are quite a lot of different roles in this, but there are some key ones. So we think that there are really important roles for visionary entrepreneurs, creating, as I said, system shifting ventures. Equally important and often neglected are the role of insider outsider. So people on the inside of systems who are conduits for new ideas to bring into systems to modernize and renew them. So Penilla is a kind of inside outsider. Um, critically, I think there are these convener roles that might convene change across many different levels. And on Thursday, we're going to hear from Alex Sutton, who's a funder at the Paul Hamlin Foundation, who is trying to play that role in the migration system. And then, if you like, there are people over here who you might describe as commissioners of the future system. And they're not necessarily people with money. You might think that Greta Thunberg is a commissioner of the future system. 
you might think that Black Lives Matter is commissioning a better system for social justice. So these, I think, are four of the key roles. But there are many others. Um, and so amongst the others that we can see are, we think there's a role for visionaries who are really radical and who open up the possible future. We think there's a role for historians who open up, if you like, the archeology span of the system to show its different roots. We definitely think there's a role for evaluators who evaluate change and create data in new kinds of ways. So there's a role for scalers and investors who are scaling the, the new system. And pretty soon, um, this board starts to look quite full of people. So there are a couple of things to bear in mind from that. The first is that if you're engaged in systems change and you feel a bit isolated, well, actually what we need to do is to start finding ways to link up all these people who are interacting or acting on the system from different uh, points of view. And so there are many different points of leverage in uh, this, if we can find ways to uh, connect them together. So you're not alone is the answer. The question is, how can you find a way to come together? Great, thank you, Charlie. So that's all quite a lot to take in and many different people playing different roles in that journey of system change. So to give everybody who's listening a little bit of a chance to reflect on where they are on this map, who else they might be um, connected to or need to connect to. Um, let's bring up the next poll. And so what we would like to hear from um, all of you listening is which main role do you see yourself in? So do you see yourself as an insider outsider? Are you an entrepreneur making something happen? Are you somebody who's bringing um, different people together to catalyze this process of system change? Or are you somebody who is commissioning or investing in what that future system might look like and be like? Um, and then you might also be playing additional roles. So you might be somebody who is setting the regulations and the frameworks for this to happen. You might be somebody who's playing that important um, position as setting the vision. Um, or helping us understand about the past, you might be a historian. Um, one of the very important roles is to, is to be the person who's helping put the current system um, to rest. So you might be uh, helping it to exit. But take a look at this list and you can choose more than one. And that's one of the important things about this is that we have different masks that we put on um, at different times. And then I'll hand it back to Charlie to see um, where we get to. There may obviously be, uh, we'll come on to you, perhaps you could raise in the, the Q&A, there may be roles that are missing from this. So there are quite a lot of people who think that data is vital to the future of systems, and we haven't really got a data role in there. Uh, and there might be other roles. So <clears throat> um, which are the main roles you could play? 52% think that they could be conveners. And then there's a pretty even split between the inside or outsiders. Um, and there's a strong visionary component to our audience. 63% um, uh, think that they want to play the role of uh, visionary and in framework setting. And that, I guess, goes with the sense of people um, operating at that kind of level. But some of these roles here are going to be just as important. So actually consumer innovators as Penilla said, are going to be really critical to generating new ideas. Uh, and in the long run, investors, exiters are going to be important as well. So we'll reflect on that. Um, so I think it's time, we'll take another look at some point at the, the graphical recording. It's time to go over, I think, to you, Johannes, to, to tell us what's been happening in the Q&A and what kinds of questions have come up and what kind of themes are emerging that people are, are raising. Obviously a lot, there's 66 different topics going on. 
I am. Uh, I, I wouldn't say I'm overwhelmed, but I'm. I'm very inspired <laughs> by everything going on here. Uh, so many interesting projects going on. I'm. I also feel uh, like hu humble, actually. To it's like this sort of all the areas that that we together here are working on. So, so a question um, that I do like that came up was, how do we actually anticipate uh, and state clear outcomes? for our system innovation. Because as it's like, as the, as the person right here, like when I pitched the proposal to sponsors, I was asked for clear outcomes forecast. So how, like that, that would be the, I guess the right side of the washing yeah. machine. We have lots of, and can we just yeah. tell sponsors like, oh, you have to get yeah. into the washing machine with us. Yeah. So I think that's a really important question. And luckily on Thursday, we have with us Giulio Quaggiato from the UNDP, who is working on that very question, because funders, philanthropic funders, or even you know venture funders will say, okay, what are your milestones? What are your outputs? Where, how, how much market share will you gain? Or how many people will you affect? And it doesn't seem very persuasive to say, well, we're learning how to develop a new system. So um, I think the answer is probably that you need to be able to show enough to the current system that you can do a good job, that you earn the right to then be able to tell your story about a different system. And so, for instance, Sophie Humphreys tomorrow and Alex Fox, uh, they run things which the current system finds it hard to dismiss because they do such a good job, they're well evaluated, there's good data, they're reg they're, um, uh, they're covered by regulation and quality control, but they're telling a different story as a result. And so this is a this is a difficult trick to pull off, can't be pulled off the whole time, but it earns you the right to do that. And then I think you, I mean, Julio on Thursday will, I think, talk about how you try and encourage and work with funders who I think are also frustrated by the limits of what they can do to then see that they've got to engage in learning, experimentation and collaboration. Great. And maybe Charlie, there's a few questions about uh, your classic Charlie uh, shortenings, SSV ah. and MVS on that model. Yeah. So these are things that I, I've done completely on the fly without telling Jenny I was going to do them. So what we're interested in is system shifting ventures. So we're not just interested in interesting micro ventures, nor are we only interested in things that can scale because sometimes you can scale something and it's just within the existing system. What we're interested in is when a, when a venture has the potential to shift a system and its logic in some kind of way. And when McLean created that containership, he created that potential. It took a long time for that system shifting potential to come out, but he created it. And I think there are lots of ventures which have that potential to say, actually, there's a new system hidden in here. And the second thing is uh, minimum viable system. So I was, I literally woke up the other night and I thought, oh, Eric Ries in his brilliant book, The Lean Startup, is always advising innovators to focus on minimum viable product. And minimum viable product is something you can get going and test very quickly. Um, and I thought, well, that's interesting, but we know that products are nowhere near as important as systems nowhere near as powerful as systems. What's the minimum viable equivalent of that for a system? And in a way, when that containerization story, after about 10 years, what they had was a minimum viable system that, that had enough of the components coming together that it could then start to claim to be a system. Now, other people have other ways of talking about that very idea. They talk about ecosystems, value creating networks, um, clusters, so on and so forth. But there's some sense of it coming together enough that it could be a effective alternative system. So a good example at the moment is as a result of COVID, uh, digital mobile primary healthcare has gone from being a minimum viable to an actually viable system, it seems to me. I guess we won't have time for much more if I'm looking at the clock. Am I right, yeah. Charlie? Yeah, 
Well, there's so many good, and we'll, we're saving the questions out here. I might also, yeah. uh, can I just add one thing? I think we have a recording of when Karen did the presentation at our former conference, and we'll make sure to share that people have been asking into, into her work. Yeah. And that'll go out with an email tomorrow. Okay. So, um, Jenny, what's your response to those questions and, and reflection? I was thinking about the first question about outcomes, because, of course, that's the same in most innovation processes, you have to start without really setting the outcomes because they only become apparent um, part way through. But I was also thinking how tricky it is to be in that situation when you're building and what you what you call a, a system shifting venture, Charlie, because you have to face both ways. You have to be facing the current system and making sure that you're doing the things that it needs and wants. And at the same time, you're in a way sort of building out the readiness um, for a new system to form. And so what we see when people are doing that is that they might be um, creating outcome measures that exist in a system that doesn't yet, hasn't taken place yet, but they can start to, to, to look for. So signals that you can start to look for if you like. Um, and they're also working with other people to sort of build up the, I don't know, the credibility or the authority for the new approach that they're taking. And so I think that is part of the way in which you give people confidence that the trajectory that you're setting out on to form this new system has some um, basis to it. And, and of course, the more people who start to also align themselves with that, that Cassie called it a, a big change narrative, um, the more likely it is that any one of those small players um, who are performing that new system um, will be successful because you need everybody to be coming together to make that, turn that opportunity into a reality. Yeah. Um, and one of the things we haven't yet um, done much thinking about, but we want to, which is a, a big theme for the Rockwell Foundation, is evaluation. Uh, Rockwell is a big believer in randomized controlled trials. And so evaluation and data and learning how to evaluate and judge um, systems change initiatives, I think is a, is a really important feature if you're going to make it easier for investors to think they're investing in not just a product or a company, a single point solution, but a system. Um, and so that kind of dynamic is I think very important. I think there are more investors, both public and private, or at least philanthropic and private, who are interested in system shifting ventures. Um, I'm just thinking about the people investing in, um, in solar systems in Africa, for instance, or in uh, new payment systems in Africa who are interested in that kind of thing. So at that, I am going to start pulling it together. Um, and how I'm going to try and pull this together um, is to say that we are very interested in continuing this conversation. Um, we will take the questions uh, that you've raised and the themes, and we will tomorrow bring them together with a, in a blog that we'll post to try and create some sort of pulling together of those themes, which our star blogger in Madrid, Florence, is going to help us uh, pull together. There is a tool that we're going to leave you with called a Padlet, um, and you can post on the Padlet. It's like a sort of interactive bulletin board. Um, and one of the questions we'd like to explore is what, what system you would like to play a role in uh, changing and reforming. Um, there's social media, LinkedIn and Twitter, of course. Um, and so we are very keen to try and um, continue with this, this conversation. I think it's time to take a look, a proper look at the work of Riley, our graphic recorder. So we could bring that up. So there, I think you can see it. Um, uh, Riley has turned Jenny's power purpose relationships into sort of like sales, um, a sort of windsurfing to systems change. Um, and how those, there's a sort of sense of a sort of systems change when there's some fluidity and flow, I suppose, is one of the underlying points about this. Um, and where uh, 
there's a sort of generation going on. I love the way that Jenny turned her symbols into a sort of almost like a propeller. Um, and so that feeling, one of the things that we haven't got to is what it feels like to be involved in systems change, often daunting, um, difficult, um, uh, perplexing, but also potentially exciting. So we will send you all a digital version of Riley's drawing. And I just want to remind you that tomorrow at three o'clock European time, we're going to have the first of our more in-depth sessions um, with Sophie Humphreys, the founder of PAUSE and the founder of Whatever It Takes, uh, who's going to be talking about her work to sort of break cycles of entrenched disadvantage, um, working within systems, but trying constantly to change them, and Alex Fox of Shared Lives Plus. And you can find more information about Sophie and Alex, including our interviews with them ahead of the session, uh, in which they set out quite a lot of the detail of how they work. You can find those interviews on our platform. Um, and thank you very much indeed for coming. And I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. Please do hang around on Padlet um, and uh, throw in your comments and questions. And we'll get back to you tomorrow and hope to carry on the conversation going through the rest of this week. And to close us off, I'm going to return us to our Danish host, Helena, and just to say that my candle is still there, and I now have my can of Carlsberg, which I'm going to open after this session is over, and we're going to have a, a Danish um, little drink. Helena. <laughs> thank you, Charlie. Uh, thank you very much for both the candle and the Carlsberg. And uh, thank you both Charlie and Jenny for providing us with some uh, guidance on how to step into systems innovation. I, being an economist, like your three levels, your four keys and surprise your 12 different roles that comes out of it. Um, so I think that's really useful. And I'm very happy with the questions, both from Penila and from Cassie, and also, also from everybody participating not least uh, your question on outcomes and our need also to remember to evaluate and Charlie remembering the RCTs, because I do think it's important to um, think about how can we prove that we are actually pushing in the right way, especially when we're shifting purpose. I hope you have all enjoyed this as much as I have. And please share any further questions you may have or comments with us on the Padlet or in the different chats that Johannes has provided for you. And I look forward to see you all again tomorrow for another great session and uh, to hear from Sophie and Alex on how it is that they are working with systems innovation in practice. So this is it for today. Thank you all for joining and see you, see you again tomorrow. <laughs>